How many of you this morning, before even getting out of bed, checked this device for text, email, Facebook? Raise them high if you did. Look at that. Is that insane? How many of you actually sleep with the phone in the same bed on the pillow next to you? Anyone? Come on. Come on. Look at that. All the single people in the room are raising their hands. Yeah. Um, when did that happen? Right? When did you suddenly start exhibiting such aberrant pathologic behavior as to sleep with your phone? That's not a technology change, right? What is that? It's not a technology change. It is a behavioral change. And what I want to talk with you about this morning is how dramatically these disruptive technologies are changing fundamentally the way we behave as individuals, but also as organizations and as a society. Uh, so much of what we're going to talk about today is about trying to visualize what you saw in that intro reel, the challenges that we don't yet know about. And I think this is always what takes us by surprise, right? Because we can project technology. Uh, a lot of things are relatively easy to predict. But one thing is not, and that's how we will behave in the face of challenge. And much of what you are doing is building an infrastructure that will allow us to have the resiliency to deal with enormous uncertainty going forward. So I want, I want to lay forth for you a landscape, if you will, that helps to understand how these new challenges, new behaviors will fit into the future that you are, that you are building. Um, we will have 10 to the 21st user community devices by 2100. What is that number? Can someone give me a, a frame of reference for that? It is 100 times as many user community devices as there are grains of sand on all the world's beaches. The real question is how will behavior change and what value will cause that behavior to change? That ultimately is the only question that we need to be able to answer. And I can recall vividly having a discussion with Adam. I called it a discussion. It was a bit more than that. He had been in the attic gaming for four or five hours. It was summer break. Uh, it was a beautiful day outside. And I went upstairs and I just, I'd had it. And I said, look, I said, you've got to get outside, buddy. You know, get some sun, go out, chase a squirrel, you know, do something, commune with nature. And Adam looked at me, and he said, uh, you can't make this stuff up. He said, uh, he said, Dad, when you were my age, what, what did you do during summer break to like, keep busy? I said, really? You little shit. I'll tell you what I did. <laughs> and we'd go out in the dead end street, and, and we would just, you know, we'd commune with nature. We'd build forts in the woods, and we'd explore, and, and you know, that's what we did. And at the end of the day, I'd come home, no cell phone. Your mother would ring, my mother would ring a bell, and, and we'd come home from dinner. She had no idea where I was. I was out fending for myself, surviving. That's what I used to do. Adam turns to me and says, um, what's a dead-end street? <laughs> it's kind of like a cul-de-sac, Adam. He said, oh, you know what, Dad? Can't make this stuff up. That, pointing to his computer, that is my cul-de-sac. Because <laughs> what do you say to that? What do you say? You say, get the hell outside. <laughs> right? Because you're, you're, you're actually making sense, Adam. That is where your friends are. And I'm going to tear you away from your friends so you can go hang out with squirrels, right? I mean, my first urgent request to you is that when we look at these new behaviors, we don't look at them as subtractive. They are always additive. And there's always a balance that we have to negotiate as a society, as individuals, around how we exhibit these new behaviors. But ultimately, the value they create for us is such that we cannot ignore it. It's why you don't leave home without this device. They really create value for the constituent. Not what does it cost them necessarily. Cost is always a factor. But how do I create value for them? What does that value look like? And they don't know to ask that value. The, 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 the reason that we all chuckle at the faster horses thing that you know, Ford is supposed to have, have said is because that's what we would have asked for, but that's not what we needed. Right? Internal combustion is what we needed at that, at that point in time. We don't know to ask for something that doesn't yet exist. In healthcare, if we do it right, the value we create will exceed that, that GDP conversion gap. So what you end up with is health care that creates greater GDP. So the trajectory of that line, the GDP line, continues to increase, and health care can stay static. And it will cost more. We want to live longer. Of course it's going to cost more. But we create more value from it. That's what the focal point needs to be, and that's when you step out of that cone of plausibility to change the way you talk about the industry. So By the time we get to the 2050s or thereabouts, we see what demographers call, very affectionately, a tombstone effect. 
where the, the delta difference between the 0 through 5 age band and the 60 through 65 age band is less than 2 percentage points. How do you sustain health care, education, agriculture, social welfare in this sort of a construct? Friction is the nemesis. Th that is, if, if you were to draw a bullseye today and at the center of it put that one thing that we can eliminate that would most create value, efficiency, productivity, prosperity, health and well-being, it would be the elimination of friction. Uber did it. We saw this. Uber did it by what? They didn't recreate the cab industry. They datafied it. They removed all the friction from the experience. And to me, you know, whether you're a patient in healthcare or whether you're a rider in an Uber, it's the same principle. That is what technology should do. Right? Get me, understand me, and adapt to me. This notion of frictionless applies to every, every industry. We're it's trading on behavior. Right? It is the currency of the future. And you and I, you and I, we are the most valuable product going forward. We take pride in being part of a generation. But like our eye color, we had nothing to do with it. We were simply born at that point in time. Take pride in your behavior, not in your generation. You are all Gen Z. Gen Z is a choice that we make. It's a behavioral choice. What does that mean to behavior and how it will change? And every one of these people will be connected. They'll all be connected to each other. We, we know this. So how do we predict the future? You'll be working with these kids because you'll continue working. Our life expectancy is increasing. Our work life expectancy is increasing. Guess what? In 2100, the two will intersect. You will be working after you're dead. Not all, all of us will go into this future willingly, by the way, right? Some of us are going to hold back. No one in this room, no one in this room, but some of us will. The promise of Gen Z is not technology. It is fundamentally changing behavior. That's your task. Ultimately, all of this will only work with the right leadership. It is about having the courage to let go of the past, to depart from the trajectories of the past. You know, my challenge to you and the challenge that I think we have as an industry is how do we fundamentally tell a story that changes that behavior so we can create an economy that truly is able to prosper in ways that we simply cannot today imagine. That's what you're building. That's what you're creating. Thank you so much for having me here today. I've enjoyed it. I hope you have as well. Thank you. Thank you.